There's all sorts of talk now all around the world about how governments have to stimulate the economy. I mean, you, you've got probably more of it now in Europe, but certainly in the U.S. as well. And it's kind of really ridiculous that even people who look at the European situation will acknowledge that the problem is that governments have too much debt. I mean, after all, it's a debt crisis. It's a sovereign debt crisis. Countries have borrowed all this money. Governments have spent all this money that they've borrowed. And for a while, they were able to borrow the money. But now the lenders have woken up and they realize that you know, many of these countries simply have borrowed beyond the capacity of their taxpayers to repay. And people are worried about risk. The creditors are worried about risk. They don't want to loan any more money uh, to these governments. And so there's a crisis that has been brought about by excess government spending and borrowing. And what is everybody demanding the government do to solve the problems? Spend even more. Borrow even more. I mean, wasn't there enough stimulus going on running up all these debts? I mean, Greece, how, think of all the stimulus that was in the Greek economy. How did the Greek government become so indebted? They spent all this money. Wasn't that stimulus? Isn't Greece so sick, specifically because of all the stimulus that made them sick? How can more stimulus be the cure for a disease that is the consequence of the same stimulus. Obviously it can't, and it should be obvious in Europe what the answer is. But the politicians there, I mean the Keynesians, there's only one play in their playbook. That's all they know. It doesn't matter what the consequences are, so they keep saying it, you know, stimulate, stimulate, stimulate. Although now they recognize that the governments can't borrow, or maybe they want to substitute the higher quality of German credit they want the Germans to come in there so more money can be borrowed, or they want more money to be printed. But the, the truth is that there are real problems in the European economy. There are structural imbalances within that Eurozone. You have uh, certain people uh, that are living beyond their means, particularly, let's say, the Greeks, and you have other Europeans, the Germans, that are making it all possible, that are living beneath their means, that are producing all the things that the Greeks uh, can't afford, but yet buy anyway. So you have these huge imbalances uh, structurally within Europe that need to be resolved. And the reason that there are these imbalances is because of government stimulus. And the only way to allow the market to restructure the Europe in a way that is feasible and viable is to withdraw the stimulus and let the market function. Uh, but you now have a battle between you know, the people who want more stimulus and those who want austerity, and we'll see uh, how that plays out. But in the United States, you, you, you can see the impact of stimulus because it, you know, it should be so obvious when you look at the, the crises that have happened in the United States. And it's amazing uh, that Europe wants to you know, follow this example. In fact, you know, you've got uh, Obama is you know, trying to put some pressure on Angela Merkel and others in Europe to, to, to provide that stimulus. You know, it's kind of like, you know, a, a kid, you know, being a bad influence on his friends. Maybe you got one kid who's trying to convince the other kid to ditch school and, and, and go to the beach uh, because it's a lot more fun uh, to go to the beach rather than sitting in a classroom all day. But Europe should re resist uh, the, the temptation to follow America's example because it's a lousy example and it's an example that has just decimated the U.S. economy. And now, you know, we've got calls for QE3 in, in the United States. And, you know, I, I remember when they first announced the QE2. And I was opposed to it at the time. And I said it wouldn't work. And I said if we do QE2, then we're going to be launching QE3 because QE2 is not going to work. And there were so many people that said, no, no, no. QE2 is the end of it. There's not going to be a QE3. Well, now it seems it's almost inevitable that we're going to have QE3, which means QE4, because it doesn't work. You know, the first quantitative easing doesn't work, didn't work, whatever, you know, which QE1. Because the problem is the stimulus is the source of the problem. So QE isn't going to work any more than you can put out a fire with gasoline. I mean, you have some Keynesians like uh, Paul Krugman, one of the most probably famous of the group, who says the problem is the QE just wasn't big enough. That was the only, only problem. Well, it doesn't matter how big it is. I don't care how much gasoline you pour on a fire. It's not going to go out. 
See, the problem is that there's not enough gasoline. The problem is you're throwing gas on the fire. You've got to put it out with water. But uh, the Keynesians don't understand that. All they know is that you put a fire out with gasoline, despite the fact that it makes it worse. And if you really want to you know, go back to the origin of the problem, maybe not the, 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 the very beginning, but in, in recent past, why did we have a stock market bubble in the United States? Why did we have a, a technology bubble? What, what fueled that? What made that possible? It was monetary stimulus. During the 1990s, you had Alan Greenspan, and he had a, a particular policy, which was anytime something threatened the economy or the stock market, he was there with monetary stimulus. He would ease and, and put more money into the banking system. He'd create inflation. And whatever it was, and there were a lot of things that went wrong during the 1990s. You had uh, the, the Russian debt defaults. You had the bankruptcy of Orange County, California. You had the, uh, the Asian economic crisis. Uh, you had um, fears over Y2K, you know, towards the end of the decade. And, and so there were various things. You had a long-term capital management. I mean, a lot of things happened. But every time something happened, there was a Federal Reserve to stimulate. In fact, Greenspan in, was involved so much in protecting the markets that they called it the Greenspan put. Everybody believed the Fed had their back. And that resulted in a lot more risk-taking than would normally have been the case if market forces had been left to bear and people thought there was more risk to what they were doing. And a lot of that cheap money ended up going into the stock market and much of it went into the riskiest part which was the internet stocks, the dot com stocks. And so you had this huge bubble in the market. And eventually interest rates rose. I mean when they, they didn't, you know, they and when they got to about six percent or something like that, um, the Fed succeeded in pricking the bubble that it had inflated. And there was a lot of air in that bubble, and, and, and it came out. And we started a recession. Now, the problem is the recession never really ended. It was cut short by more stimulus. You see, what a lot of the Keynesians don't understand is that if you look at the business cycle, which is a byproduct not of capitalism, but generally government meddling in, in, in a money supply, because whenever you get the stimulus, this monetary stimulus, you send a lot of false economic signals to the various players in the market. And the result is that you get an inefficient allocation of resources, labor, capital. Um, they, they become uh, you know, engaged in ways that they wouldn't had the government not interfered. Because what happens when they create more money is it looks to the market as if there's more savings. And therefore, there's more uh, money to, uh, to fund investments because it looks like people have deferred uh, you know, their, their time preferences to consumption in the future rather than consumption today. And so you, you, you have mistakes. You have uh, projects that aren't, really shouldn't be funded that end up uh, getting funded. And of course, you know, when you have all the cheap money out there, um, you know, people, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily act rationally. It's almost like they're, they're under the influence of, of a drug. They're intoxicated. In fact, when we had the housing bubble, George Bush, one of the things he kept saying was that Wall Street got drunk. And that's why we had a housing bubble, because Wall Street was drunk. And I acknowledge that plenty of people on Wall Street were drunk. But it wasn't just Wall Street. Main Street was drunk. The whole country was drunk. Uh, but what uh, George Bush didn't do, or he didn't bother to ask the question, why? Why were they all drunk? How'd they get so drunk? Where'd they get all that alcohol? Right? Well, they got it from the Federal Reserve. Right? Alan Greenspan was the bartender who liquored everybody up. And sure, yeah, when you're drunk, you do a lot of foolish things. You know, just like, you know, in real life, you get drunk and go out and, uh, you know, do crazy things at a party. And you don't realize it until the following morning. And then you sober up and you, you, know, you can't believe the things that you did. Well, that's what happened. And the people were like, you know, I can't believe I bought that dot-com stock. How could I have paid that much for this company? You know, people start thinking clearly. The stimulus wears off. You know, and the mistakes are revealed. And so the recession is where the market tries to undo the damage that was caused during this phony boom. And when that happens, some people have to lose their jobs because they got jobs they never should have got because companies you know, shouldn't have hired them. 
People rent real estate that they shouldn't have rented. They didn't need the space. So, you know, you have an economic downturn. Spending declines because people now, you know, they were, they, they, there's people unemployed. People thought they were getting rich. Now they're not as rich as they thought. So you have a, a contraction. But instead of allowing the contraction to run its course, which is the right thing to do economically, the politicians can't resist a quick cure because that's how they get votes. They don't get votes telling people, hey, you know, we got to swallow this bitter tasty medicine, uh, but it'll, you know, the economy will heal and eventually it'll get better. What gets elected is promising something, right? Like, just like, you know, what's the more popular diet? You know, if you want to lose weight, the, the, the diet and the exercise, but it's, no, I got a miracle cure. I just got some cream. You just got to rub it on your thighs, right? That's what the public wants to hear. Right? They, don't, they, don't, they don't want to hear the truth. So you get more stimulus. And the politicians want to take credit. If, ever, if the stimulus creates any kind of bounce, even if it's not real, even if it's ultimately going to collapse. And that's what happened with the housing bubble. The housing bubble was created by government stimulus. And it was created, it started you know, with the stock market bubble because the cheap money uh, of the 1990s also went into housing. I mean, the housing prices started rising in 96, 97. So it, they didn't start in 2000. But when the real estate bubble, when the stock market bubble burst, all that liquidity just flowed into the real estate market. And since it was already rising, it just fueled the bubble even further. And as real estate prices rose, the effects on the economy were far greater than in the stock market because people were much more likely to spend real estate wealth than they were stock market wealth because it was so easy to extract it. And since there was so much leverage, homeowners were making a lot more money on their houses than they were making on their stock portfolio. So it had a much bigger impact on consumer spending and the psychology of the market. Uh, and of course, the, the other big difference, and I, I pointed this out you know, in my original book, Crash Proof, was that when people were buying stocks, they were mainly buying it with their own money. But when people were buying real estate, they were buying it with somebody else's money. And, and therefore, it was going to be a credit crisis because I knew that the, the, the institutions lending the money weren't going to get it back. And the greater problem was when people were buying stocks, there were no government guarantees. Yet when people were buying houses, you had government guaranteeing these loans. So this was a bigger mess because the taxpayer was going to be on the hook. But we got, I don't know, five, six years of phony economic growth following the bursting of the stock market bubble. And George Bush thought this was great. Everybody thought this was great. You had all kinds of people talking about how great the economy was. A lot of re you know, Republicans, conservatives were defending uh, this phony economy. I was out there criticizing it for years because I recognized it for what it was. It was a housing-related mania. It was a bubble. There was imaginary wealth. And all we were doing was having a huge party as we were spending this borrowed money. And I knew that eventually the bubble would burst, that home prices would fall, and that the losses uh, to the economy would be enormous. But when it happened, did the government learn anything? No. Did, did, did Ben Bernanke learn anything from um, Alan Greenspan? Did he, did, he look, did, he, did he make the connection? Did he say, gee, Greenspan lowered interest rates to 1% and he kept them there for years and then he raised them too slow and because of that, he fueled the housing bubble, which has done tremendous damage to the economy. I better not make that mistake again. Did Bernanke say that? No. Bernanke actually one-upped them. Bernanke lowered interest rates to zero. Zero. Think about that. Look at all the damage we did to the economy with a 1% interest rate. Imagine how much more damage we're going to do with 0%. And what about the fiscal side? Did Barack Obama take a look at the big deficits under George Bush and say, gee, that was a big mistake. I don't want to repeat that. You know, no, his deficits are many times as large. Our deficits are now a trillion, three, a trillion and a half a year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just a, the funded portion. So we have a bigger dose of Keynesian stimulus now than we had under, under Bush and, and Greenspan. So therefore, the hangover, when the stimulus wears off, is going to be worse. So imagine that. I mean, think about how bad it was in 2008. Now think about how much worse it's going to be 
when this round of stimulus wears off. Because usually, too, the, the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. And the bigger the bust, the more stimulus you actually need to try to generate you know, a, a phony uh, high to the economy. And you know, we, the U.S. economy is now so hooked on cheap money, so hooked on this, we're so addicted to it, that we've, it, the economy has built up a tolerance because you need so much of it now, but you don't even get the same effect. I mean, we have, we have thrown more stimulus at this economy now, yet the unemployment rate can't even get below 8%. This is at the height of the expansion. We can't even get below 8%. And that's, and that's not even the real number. The real number is about 15%. And the government reports that number. I'm not making it up. I mean, they report a number called U6, which is people who have given up looking for work and people who are just working part-time but are still looking for full-time work. They're, when you count them as being unemployed, which, of course, they are, then the number is about 15%. You know, the labor force participation rate in America is about the lowest it's been since, I think, the early 70s. And if you look at it for men, because, you know, before the 70s, women didn't work anyway because their husbands can afford to support them. But they had to go into the labor force in, in, in the 70s because the taxes were so high and inflation was so high, their husbands couldn't afford to support them anymore. But if you just look at men, labor force participation among men, I think it's the lowest it's been since uh, the, the 50s or the 40s, the end of the Second World War. Why are all these men leaving the labor force in America? Is it because they're, they're retiring early because they're so wealthy? No, it's because there's no jobs. The jobs have been destroyed. A lot of them have gone on disability. You've got millions and millions of American men, probably able-bodied, that are now collecting disability. Right? They're not really disabled. It's just that the job market was disabled. But they don't, you know, they don't show up in the statistics. So even though we've had all this stimulus, we've got officially over 8% unemployment and unofficially 15%. Interest rates didn't even rise. We never even raised rates. They're still at zero. And we're rolling over into another recession. So imagine that. We're starting a recession with the statistics that are closer to where you are at the bottom of a recession. We've just had the recovery. And that's, this is how low we are. It's like you know, we were in a, a, a building and we took the elevator to the basement. Now we're going to go down. How are we going to go down from where we are right now? We, did, we, didn't, we didn't get any kind of phony economic growth. And I say it's phony, but we did have some GDP growth in the U.S. And a lot of people think, aha, you see, America's stimulus is working. That's why Europe should follow our example, because we do have this GDP growth. Well, so what? So what do we have GDP growth? At what cost? How much did we pay for that growth? We have maybe 2% growth in the GDP, but we increase the debt five times that amount. Does it make sense to borrow a trillion dollars to get $200 billion of GDP? What about what happens when you have to pay the money back? Then what happens to your GDP? What about the interest? Yes, you know, Europe doesn't have that little bit of phony growth because they have some elements of, of austerity. But that doesn't mean the austerity is wrong just means it hasn't had enough time to work. You know, it's, if you're sick and you need to take some medicine, you know, there's a good chance that the medicine isn't going to taste good. But that doesn't mean that you don't swallow it. See, the Europeans have now got a taste of that medicine, and they don't like it, and everybody is saying, well, spit the medicine out because it doesn't taste good. Well, if you spit it out, you're not going to get better. That's what we're telling them. We're telling Europe to spit the medicine out, to follow our example. See, we're not taking any medicine at all. All we take is Novocaine. Right? Because we don't want to feel the pain, but we let it get worse. And so that, that's where we are right now. And, you know, the only reason I think that the U.S. economy is not already right, imploding, because when I, when I wrote Crash Proof, I figured that the real crash would have already happened. Now, I didn't think the real crash was uh, the, 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 the recession that we had in 08. I mean, I saw that coming. And when I wrote Crash Proof, I basically said, we got this huge housing bubble. Government created it, created by the Fed. Fannie and Freddie created it. Uh, and, you know, by the way, I'm testifying in front of Congress uh, on Thursday for the second time. If you want to see my first congressional testimony, it's up on YouTube. You can just Peter Schiff congressional testimony, and there's about 35 minutes of it you can, you can see on YouTube. 
This one will be on YouTube too, so you should look for it. It, it should be interesting because I'm going there to testify on whether or not the Fed should expand the FHA from single family homes to multifamily, guaranteeing mortgages. And of course, I'm going to testify that not only shouldn't they expand into multifamily, but they should get out of single family. That in fact the whole agency should be shut down. And I'm going to you know, give Congress a lesson on, on, on what they've done to help destroy this economy, particularly the housing market. So it'll be, it'll be an interesting discussion. But when I, when I wrote Crash Proof, and I said, okay, we're going to have the housing bubble is going to burst. There's going to be a huge recession because people are going to stop spending because their home equity is going to vanish. The banks are going to be in trouble because the collateral for all their loans are going to collapse. And so banks are going to fail. Fannie and Freddie are going to go bankrupt. It's going to be a huge recession. I said, it's going to be the worst recession since the Great Depression. But that wasn't the crash that I was preparing people for. That was the event that was going to set the crash into motion. Because in that book, I then said the government is going to make the same mistakes again. They're going to repeat the same mistakes that it blew up the bubble. They're going to try to reflate the economy. They're going to try to stimulate with cheap money, with trillion dollar a year deficit spending. Uh, and it was the consequence of that that was going to uh, bring on the real crash. Right? That it wasn't this disease that I was diagnosing uh, that was going to kill us but the government's cure for that disease that was ultimately going to be lethal. And I thought it probably would have happened during the Obama term, his first term. I think, the, I think the one thing that I didn't really factor into, and when you're forecasting the future, there's always so many events that you don't know because, after all, it's, it's in the future. And so things can happen to screw up your timeline. And I think the thing that happened was, was Europe. And it's not that I, I didn't recognize the European problems. I did from the very beginning. I mean, I was talking about this crisis in Europe the minute they formed the Eurozone. The minute I saw the terms of that treaty, I knew it was a disaster waiting to happen. I just figured the disaster would happen later than ours. Um, and it still might, because there's still a, they could still find a, a, a temporary solution and buy some more time. Because you do have a lot of wealthy economies in Europe that can subsidize these poor economies if they want to. Uh, I think it's a mistake. But they might make those mistakes because politicians often do those things. They want to you know, kick the can down the road rather than deal with it. And so they can do that in Europe. They can afford to. There's enough wealth there. I mean, if you look at the situation in Europe, Europe as, as a whole, the community, that, the, the countries that share the euro currency, collectively are in much better shape than the United States. And, and so they do have the, 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 the wealth to postpone this if they, if they want to. And I think the difference and the reason that Europe is now in crisis is because the markets are forcing the issue right now. And America, I think, as a result, has got a bit of a reprieve. I think we've got more time now because people are so worried about Europe that they are buying dollars, right? They're, they're buying treasuries. And so because of that, interest rates are lower. We could borrow more money. Consumer prices in America are lower because it's keeping the dollar up. All this is benefiting our phony economy. I mean, benefiting in that it keeps it going a little longer. And so it's kind of ironic when you hear a lot of politicians pointing to Europe as the cause of our problems. They don't realize that Europe is the best thing we got going for us. Right? The fact that people think Europe is in worse shape than America, that's all we got. That's our ace in the hole right now. I mean, the worst thing that would happen to the U.S. economy is all this a, a big uh, resolution to the problems in Europe because that would put downward pressure on the dollar, upward pressure uh, on, on interest rates. But, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that people are buying um, the dollar or U.S. treasuries as a safe haven, especially if what they're worried about is European debt. Because, as I said, we got more debt than Europe. So, I mean, you're jumping from the frying pan in, in a into the fire. So I think, it, I think at some point and people are going to realize they, they made a mistake. And probably a good analogy would be Facebook. And you know, I think the, the treasuries are going to be the Facebook of safe havens. You know, the way Facebook worked, everybody wanted to buy Facebook. It was the most highly touted uh, IPO probably ever. And huge IPO. $20, $20 billion, uh, you know, massive deal. Everybody was lining up to buy it. 
And most people just wanted to buy it because they figured that they could sell to somebody else. Everybody figured it would be this big pop because so many people wanted it and everybody wanted a piece of the action. Uh, they didn't really care about the valuation because they were going to sell it to somebody else who didn't care about the valuation. Right? They were going to look for that greater fool. Well, the problem is the deal was so big that all the fools bought on the IPO. <laughs> and there were no greater fools left. They were all in. And, and then, you know, when they didn't get the big pop, right, they actually bothered to look at what they owned. Oh, say, I got these shares of Facebook. And they, they looked at the earnings, they looked at the fundamentals, and they realized that it wasn't what it cracked up to be. And they wanted to get out. But, of course, who were they going to sell to? Because all the people who wanted it owned it. So price goes down. I think the same thing is happening. People, oh no, the euro is in trouble. Let's buy the dollar. Let's buy U.S. treasuries. It's a safe haven. Okay, until you actually take a look at what you own and realize that you have just loaned money to the most indebted uh, entity on the planet. In fact, as far as I know, it, 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 in the universe. If, there, if, there, if, there's, if there's a government anywhere else in the universe, I doubt that it's as broke as America. So how, how, could you, how could it possibly be a safe haven? And you know, I, hear, I hear this comparison all the time. People say, look, you know, America's not Greece because America has a printing press. Yeah, I know. That's what's so scary. People act as if a printing press is, a, is our salvation, that somehow it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. Hey, you don't have to worry about buying treasuries because America has a printing press. That's exactly why you have to worry. People act as if, well, you know, if, if we print money, that counts as paying. No, it doesn't. Because what if the money doesn't buy anything? What good is that? You know, if, 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 you, if you can't repay what you've borrowed, there are two things that you can do, right? Because you, by definition, you can't repay. So you can either default, right, which is the risk in Europe that people are worried about, or you can inflate. But either way, the creditors don't get their money back. I mean... In one, one way, they get their money back. They just don't get all of it back, right? They get a portion. Like originally, Greece, uh, Greece's creditors agreed uh, to a 50% haircut on the debt. So they get half of what they loan. And who knows? You know, by the end of the day, they'll, they'll end up with a crew cut because I don't think Greece can even pay half of what it borrowed. But in the alternative, right, there is no default. The government pays everything, but it prints the money. In which case, the money loses value, and the purchasing power is gone. And you, you might end up losing more purchasing power. It might be better to get 50 cents on the dollar, where your 50 cents still has value, than to get 100 cents on the dollar, where it, it, it feels like you got 10 cents. Because that's how much prices have gone up, because the currency has collapsed. And eventually, creditors are going to look at the, the fact that America can't pay its bills, and are going to start to be concerned about inflation and purchasing power and the dollar. And, and when that happens, I mean, that's when we're going to have our real crisis in the United States. In the meantime, the Fed continues to stimulate the economy, uh, trying to delay that day of reckoning. But of course, you know, the more stimulus we have, the worse the situation ultimately gets. And, you know, there are a lot of people, if you look at the U.S. economy now, because supposedly we're, what, three years into the recovery, you know. And interest rates are still at that emergency level. Rates are still zero, and the Fed has promised to keep them at zero, I don't know, for years. And a lot of people are thinking, well, the Fed is making a mistake now. They're being too easy. They should tighten a little bit, or at least they were up until recently. And the analogy that I would often hear on television, people would say they, they were equating the stimulus with training wheels on a bike. And, and they said, gee, you know, we needed, we needed those training wheels for a while because the economy was a real mess, and so we needed the training wheels to get the bike moving. But now the bike is rolling along on its own. It doesn't need the training wheels anymore. The Fed needs to take off those training wheels. And, you know, I heard that a lot. And I think the analogy was wrong because I don't think the stimulus were the training wheels. And I think the Fed knows that the stimulus is not the training wheels. The stimulus are the only wheels. Right? The economy is coasting on stimulus. That's what's going on. And the Fed knows if it takes the stimulus away, right, the, the bike, that's your metaphor, is just going to fall over because it can't go without the stimulus wheels. But 
That doesn't mean the Fed shouldn't remove the stimulus. See, a lot of people who were saying remove the stimulus had no idea what the consequences would be because they, did, they thought it was training wheels. They didn't know the stimulus were the only wheels. But the problem is the bike is, is, is going over a cliff. We're, we're, we're pedaling towards the edge of a cliff with those stimulus wheels. And so if we don't take the stimulus away, we're going to go over that cliff. And you know, we're not going to survive the impact. So it's better to take the wheels off now and, and just let the bike fall over. Maybe we'll get you know, beat up a little bit, black and blue, but we'll survive. That is what is needed. But the Fed knows that it can't let interest rates go up. And, and here's why. And this is, let's, I'll give you a little bit of a picture of what's going to happen. And of course, you'd say, well, you know, why don't we just leave interest rates low forever? If the economy is going to be such a mess, if interest rates go up, well, the Fed can just keep interest rates low indefinitely. Well, you can't do that. It's impossible. The markets will not allow you to do it indefinitely. But one of the things that people just don't seem to understand is that the main problem in the United States is that interest rates are too low. I mean, that is the source of our imbalances. Rates are just too low. And because they're too low, we don't save enough, we don't produce enough, we spend too much, we borrow too much, the government is too big, we have huge imbalances. We, we, we have, uh, what, $50 billion plus a month trade deficit. That's over $600 billion a year. That's enormous, uh, the amount of goods that we import that we can't afford. Uh, yet the world lends us the money to buy it. But why doesn't the American economy produce the things that Americans need? Because it's too screwed up because all of the malinvestments that are the result of interest rates being too low. We, most people will accept, even the Keynesian economists will accept in, in general, although sometimes they, they even don't get this right, um, that the market should set prices, that bureaucrats shouldn't just pick prices. Because if you pick a price, you're probably going to pick the wrong one. And the result is going to be a shortage or a surplus. And you, you, know, you need uh, to discover the price through the market. And that's the only way to really have an equilibrium and you know, to allocate resources effectively is through a market-based price. Well, in America, we have markets determining a lot of prices. Not all prices, but most prices are determined by the market. And it works. It works really well. But what about interest rates? Right? Interest rates are the price of money. And you could argue that probably the most important price is the price of money. Right? Because money is on one side of every transaction in America. So you got to get the price of money right, which would mean that we need the market to discover the price of money. But it doesn't. The government sets it. It price fixes it. Right? In America, interest rates are set the same way the Soviet Union used to set the bread price. Well, obviously, it doesn't work. And the, the Fed is also under a lot of pressure to set rates low, lower than the market would have them, because of the, the, the debtors. Because A, the government is the biggest debtor, and the government needs low interest rates. But most Americans are in debt. The average American voter is a debtor. He has a mortgage, he has a student loan, he has car loans, he has credit card debt. He needs low interest rates. So the Fed is under intense political pressure to keep interest rates artificially low, and that is why the U.S. economy is so screwed up. And until interest rates are allowed to rise, we're never going to have a real recovery. It doesn't matter what they do. As long as they keep interest rates too low, we'll never restructure the economy along the lines that would be necessary to create real economic growth. So the best we can do is blow up bubbles that will keep bursting, and, and with stimulus and, and keep digging the U.S. economy into a greater and greater hole, borrowing more and more money in the process. Now, the Fed knows right now how completely addicted we are to its stimulus, to the cheap money. That's why it's got interest rates at zero. But I said it can't keep them there forever because one of the byproducts of zero percent interest rates, right, is the inflation that is, you know, created in order to buy up all those bonds. And, you know, the Fed lies about inflation. The Fed pretends there is no inflation. It hides behind government statistics that really do a good job of masking the inflation because of the methodology for calculating it. 
But the Fed has a lot of help in hiding inflation because it has foreign central banks all around the world that buy up a lot of the dollars that we print. And in the process, they send goods into America. See, America, in our trade, right, we import things and we export paper. We export dollars and import real things. So goods come into America and the money flows out. So that keeps a lid on American prices. But of course, it makes prices in other countries like China go up. See, that's one of America's greatest exports is inflation. And we export a lot of it to countries like China who have to deal with it. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we're able to delay it. But eventually, look, all that money is going to come back. They're not going to take our inflation forever. You have tremendous distortions in uh, China and other emerging markets that are just drowning in a sea of dollars right now that have huge foreign exchange reserves, and it's costing their people a fortune to accumulate these reserves. You know, the, the real, the real uh, uh, a threat to the global economy is not America collapsing. That's actually going to be its salvation. The real threat is the enormous cost of propping us up. That's the problem. As the American economy weakens, the problem for Asia is that they're, they're foolishly trying to prop it up. And it's not easy. And it drains them of a lot of resources that could be used more productively in their own economies. But eventually, inflation is going to show up in a bigger way. The Fed is not going to be able to lie about it. The Fed is going to have to do something about it. What can the Fed do about inflation? Well, in reality, nothing. Because if it raises interest rates, it's going to destroy the economy, which, of course, needs to be destroyed because it's phony. We have to destroy the phony economy in order to rebuild a viable one. But the Fed looks as, as, at its role as trying to perpetuate. Um, you know, it's created this monster, and it, and it wants to keep it alive. right? And, and so it has to keep rates down. But, of course, it has, to, it has to maintain the myth that it's an inflation fighter, not an inflation creator. So it says, you know, I'm ready to raise interest rates. The Fed is, the minute we see inflation, we're going to raise rates. Well, you know, no, they're not. I mean, it's all, it's all bark. There's no bite there. But they have to say that. They can't acknowledge the predicament that they're in because then it's all over. Then, you know, people will, uh, you know, they'll dump the dollar. But eventually, rates have to go up. And here's the reason that the Fed won't let rates go up. What would happen to the U.S. economy if interest rates were allowed to seek their market level? Well, we know that the market rate would be a lot higher than the current rate. I mean, if the Fed wasn't buying all these bonds, if we had a stand on our own credit quality, the U.S. government, without the Fed buying, right? If the U.S. government was constrained by its ability to tax and repay its loans, if the Fed was tightening and wasn't the buyer of, you know, only resort right now, where would interest rates be? God, who knows? I think they'd be higher than they are in Spain or, or Italy or France. But even if they just went to the same level, Spain, they're about 7% right now. And 7% wouldn't even be historically high for the U.S. It's been a lot higher. Oh, rates got to 20% in 1980 when America was in much better financial shape than it is today. But what would happen if rates went to 7%? Well, I, I mean, it would be Armageddon. I mean, you think things are bad in Spain. You ain't seen nothing yet compared to what it would look like in America if interest rates were 7%. First, let's look at the banks. What would happen to the banks? I mean, J.P. Morgan had a $2 billion loss, right? Now I just read this morning that it's now up to $4.5 billion. And who knows you know, where it's going to be by the time they close the trade because they're still stuck in their position. Um, but that's nothing compared to how, J how much money J.P. Morgan is going to lose if interest rates went to 7%. And not just J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, Bank of America. I think a 7% Fed funds rate would pretty much bankrupt all those banks. The failure would be bigger than they were in 2008. And of course, there'd be no bailout next time around. Because a bailout presumes the Fed is easing, because the Fed has to supply the money for the bailout. If the Fed is tightening, there's no bailouts for anybody. So all the banks we bailed out are going to fail even bigger more spectacularly, a bigger uh, losses than what would have been the case had we let them fail in 08, which was what we should have done, right? The government should have let the banks fail in 2008. Now, wouldn't that have brought on a bigger crisis if they did that? Of course. Just like we would have had a bigger recession had they not intervened and after the stock market bubble burst. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't have done it. Two wrongs don't make a right because the government makes the mistake of creating a bubble 
doesn't mean they should compound the mistake by trying to you know, intervene to prevent it from deflating. But we made that mistake in, in 2008. And so we, we kept making that mistake. So all these banks would, would fail with rising interest rates. In fact, I think it was ironic, or not even not ironic, maybe it's not the word, but it was deliberately deceitful that the, the Federal Reserve uh, asked banks, and this is a couple months ago, to submit some stress tests to prove to the world that our banks were healthy. And the Federal Reserve asked um, the banks to stress test two things. Basically, the bursting of the stock market bubble and the bursting of a real estate bubble. Well, those bubbles already burst. What's the point of stress testing those? Hey, the one bubble that they didn't ask the banks to stress test was the bond market bubble. Why didn't the Fed ask the banks to see how their balance sheets could handle a big spike in interest rates? Well, I think I, the reason is obvious, because they knew the banks would all fail that test, and they didn't want anybody to know that they would fail that test. So they didn't ask them to do it. But the banks are loaded up with long-term treasuries, long-term mortgages, and how are they financing it? They borrow from the Fed at practically nothing, and they turn around and they reloan the money to the treasury, to the housing market. But when interest rates go up, the profits become losses because now it costs them more to borrow the money than what they're earning on their assets. So their, their income turns into huge losses and their collateral collapses. Their, their, their balance sheet implodes because those bonds now have lost a lot of value. And what about all the real estate loans? Right, right now, real estate prices in the U.S. are the lowest they've been nationwide since the bubble burst, the peak in 06. And that's despite record low interest rates. I mean, mortgage interest rates now are in the threes. And I think inflation, the real rate of inflation is higher than that, which means they're paying people to buy houses and they still won't do it. And the prices are falling. So imagine what's going to happen to real estate prices if Fed funds rate went to 7% and, and mortgage rates were 8 or 9%. Imagine. Where would the housing market be? Where would the banks be? I mean, it's going to be a complete collapse. But probably one of the biggest factors that the Fed understands is what about the U.S. Treasury? What happens to the U.S. Treasury if interest rates go to 7%? Well, the same thing that happened to Greece. We default or restructure because we can't afford to service the debt at 7%. It's not possible. And that's just servicing it. I mean, we can't even think about repaying it. And, you know, I hear this argument all the time because I say, you know, we can't possibly repay our debts. And the conventional wisdom is, well, we don't have to pay our money, the debts back. Well, what do you mean we don't have to pay them back? I mean, they say, well, we just borrow forever. Well, do the lenders know about our plans? <laughs> you know, because if we can borrow without, without ever having to pay it back, that means the world is willing to lend and never get their money back. You know, which, by the way, is the most important part of the whole lending process. It's, it's, it's getting your money back. But basically we say, no, 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 because, you know, people, people get their money back because they roll over the debt. See, this is, this is how America runs its, its, uh, its balance sheet right now, or its debt. You see, we sell bonds, and then when, we, when they mature, we borrow the money to pay off the principal. And we usually borrow it from the same people who loaned it to us in the first place. And when interest is due, well, we borrow that money from the people who loaned it to us. Well, I mean, what kind of a way to, to run a, a, you know, a, a business? I mean, can you think of anybody else who had the exact same business plan as the U.S. government? <laughs> yeah, Bernie Madoff. That's why you're laughing. He's in jail. <laughs> right? That was Bernie Madoff's plan. Right? I think there's a lot of questions. <clears throat> Oh, you, is that why you're standing up? I guess, give me a few more minutes. But anyway, but, but anyway, so I'll try to do another five minutes. But anyway, so, so um, um, yeah, Bernie, I mean, that was his plan. It was the greater fool, right? We, we always figure that there's going to be somebody else willing to lend because we obviously can't repay the principal. I mean, the U.S. has about $5 trillion in debt that comes due in the next year. I mean, we, there's no way we can, we can get that money. In fact, if you think back a year ago or two years ago when we had our, our crisis regard, regard, regarding the debt ceiling, um, there was actually talk that we were going to default if we didn't raise the debt ceiling. I pointed out at that time that that was an admission that we were running a Ponzi scheme. What did we say? 
We told the world we were running a Ponzi scheme. And in general, if you're running a Ponzi scheme, that's not what you want to do. You want to keep it real quiet. You don't want to admit it. But we told the world, if we can't borrow more money, well, we're not going to pay back the money we've already borrowed. Right? We didn't say, we didn't tell our bondholders, don't worry, we'll raise taxes to make good on our debts. Or don't worry, we'll cut spending. No, no. What was what we said? We said, if we can't pay our debts, the first people who are going to suffer are the bondholders because we're not going to pay. Well, that's an admission that eventually, if the world doesn't want to lend us money, we're not going to pay. And if we try to keep interest rates artificially low, if inflation is 10% and we're asking the world to lend us money at zero, 1%, 2%, they're not going to do it. And if interest rates went up 7%, which is what I, I said when I started this analogy, and if we had, let's say, a $20 trillion debt when it happened, let's say this happened two years from now, and the national debt is $20 trillion, let's say, well, what's 7% of $20 trillion? And the reason I'm taking the whole budget the whole, is because it's all financed like an adjustable rate mortgage. It's all T-bills. I mean, there's some long-term treasuries, but most of the debt is short-term. So let's say interest on the national debt goes to $1 trillion a year, which is half of the government's tax receipts. But of course, how much ta revenue would the government be collecting when interest rates were at 7%, housing was tanking, banks were failing? I think the government's revenues would plunge. So under this scenario, you know, we could have $3 trillion or more annual deficits trying to finance them at ridiculously high interest rates. There is no way the government can pay. And politically, it's going to be impossible for the U.S. government to make interest payments to the Chinese, interest payments to the Saudis or the Japanese while slashing the pay of government workers, slashing the, the, the benefits of people on Social Security. You think the Americans are going to, are going to take that any better than the Greeks? are taking it when they're being asked to sacrifice. So the Federal Reserve knows this. The only thing standing between the fault uh, is the Fed and its printing press. But the only thing that's enabling that is that the world hasn't figured out this predicament yet. But it's coming, and, and the real crash is coming, and that, you know, that is the subject of, of my latest book. And we need to prepare for that and understand, and I don't really have a lot of time, obviously, or any time, so I guess I'll just end it there. <laughs> And I see, because I see this guy standing here in my peripheral vision, and it, it keeps interrupting my train of thought, so. Finally, I succeeded. I know, I know, and it's, believe me, it's distracting, because I'm trying to think on one side of my brain, I'm saying, what's this guy doing on the other side, you know? There's many people here that I think have a question. Please, go ahead. Right. Uh, you're talking about uh, how long can they keep interest rates at zero. Japan seemed to be able to do that indefinitely. Yeah. And of course, their economy's gone nowhere. Yeah, so it didn't work out that well for Japan, did it? And of course, look at the debt to GDP that Japan has now. I mean, that's obviously a problem just because, you know, it hasn't, you know, been felt yet. I mean, what's going to happen when interest rates rise in Japan? I mean, that's not going to be a pretty picture. But I think Japan has given America a false sense of confidence in that we look at Japan and see how long they were able to keep interest rates at zero. And we say, you see, we could do it too. Well, you have to look at what was Japan's debt to GDP when they started. It was very, very low, number one. And number two, during the entire period that Japan was borrowing money, their own citizens were saving money. So the Japanese government was simply borrowing from Japanese citizens. And during the same time, the Japanese economy was so productive that they've run persistent trade surpluses. In fact, if it weren't for China, Japan would be the world's largest creditor nation. I mean, Japan is sitting on over a trillion dollars of treasuries. So they could certainly pay off a lot of their debt if they could sell those treasuries. Um, so the thing is, Japan is in much better shape fiscally than America. They're solvent, you know, and they can afford to make these stupid mistakes. I mean, it, they shouldn't be making them. It's to their own detriment. Their economy would be in much better shape had they not amassed these huge deficits, had they simply allowed the economy to restructure, allowed companies to fail, allowed the yen to appreciate more. They would have been in much better shape. But they decided to go this stimulus route, this Keynesian route, and so they have suffered. But, you know, they were a wealthy nation, and they're not as wealthy as they would have been had they not done it, but, you know, they're still wealthy. America is night and day from Japan. We're the exact opposite situation. We're already broke, right? We don't have the domestic savings pool to tap into. We're borrowing from abroad. 
Right? We have huge trade deficits, not surpluses. We're the world's biggest debtor nation. We owe more than all the other debtor nations combined. So, you know, we can't make these mistakes. We're not Japan. You know, we don't have all that time, right? Uh, you know, we don't have all that rope to hang ourselves with. It's a, it's a short, short rope. So, I think it's deceptive to think that we can do that. Uh, because uh, there's no way the world is going to make that possible. I mean, think about how much money we would have to borrow. Because remember, our phony economy needs more and more debt to maintain itself. So the deficits have to keep getting bigger and bigger. And of course, we keep having to borrow more and more money to get a smaller amount of GDP growth. So who knows, eventually we might have to borrow a trillion just to get a hundred billion of GDP. And then maybe two trillion just to get 50 billion. I mean, the numbers are just so enormous. The world can't afford us. So it, it, we don't have, I, it can't possibly go on for anywhere near that length of time uh, before, before the whole thing implodes. Can it go on another six months? Yeah, you know, but maybe it can't. I don't know. It's like how many, uh, you know, straws can you put on a camel's back? I don't know. But eventually, it's one too many, and you know, our, our camel is, you know, is, is, you know, is pretty much, you know, ready to go. I mean, you know, I don't know how many more, but a year, two years. But I think it's, I think it's going to happen. You know, we're going to have a sovereign debt crisis, a currency crisis in America. All right? What's happening in Europe? All right. Warm event. If, in fact, if you go back and remember the subprime crisis, right, the big word everybody said back then was contained. Hey, everybody said, don't worry about the mortgage market or the housing market. It's just subprime. It's contained to the subprime market. The same people are saying the same thing about sovereign debt. Hey, it's contained to Europe. Don't worry. It's just a few of these countries in southern Europe. It's not going to come to America. Well, it is going to come to America. We're not going to escape the consequences of this profligacy, especially when we're in worse shape than Europe. And it's not just America, the federal government. Look at the states. We have states that are broke, too. And it's the states and the government, they're all trying to fund themselves from the same taxpayer who's also broke. And many of them are unemployed. And they're up to their own eyeballs in debt. So how is, it, how is an indebted nation going to pay its bills by tapping into an indebted citizenry. It's impossible. Suzanne. Yeah. You have a, an election coming up. Any um, political observations? Yeah, unfortunately, one of these guys is going to win. <laughs> and, you know, same old, same old. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was a Ron Paul fan, still am, uh, supported Ron, but, you know, unfortunately, there weren't enough of me. And, uh, you know, so, you know, Mitt Romney is, is going gonna, is gonna to run. So, you know, I think it's, it's a race between somebody who doesn't really understand capitalism and someone who doesn't believe in capitalism. Um, you know, I, so, I don't know, I mean, I think on the margin, Romney is not going to be as bad as, um, as Obama. So, you know, I guess we got that going for us if he wins. But is he going to be better than Bush, right? I mean, are we just going to dial back to the, to the Bush era because Bush was a disaster. And does Romney recognize what a disaster Bush was? I don't think so. I mean, he surrounds himself with the same type of people that were surrounding Bush. He supported Bush. He thought the Bush, you know, he, he, he liked Bush when he ran in 08. You know, I don't know. He was, uh, he was recently asked in a press conference if he would support uh, the Ron Paul plan to cut a trillion dollars from the deficit in, in year one. And he said, no, no, I wouldn't support that plan because we can't afford to take a trillion dollars out of the economy. As if government spending puts money into the economy. It takes money out of the private sector and diverts it to the public sector, but that undermines the economy. If you cut a trillion dollars of federal spending, you return that trillion into the private sector and it grows the real economy. You have to shrink the government to grow the economy. It's, it's one or the other. And unfortunately, uh, he doesn't really seem to appreciate the significance of that. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's much hope. I, I, you know, I say I'd rather have Romney, you know, you know, at, you know, at the helm when, you know, when we hit the iceberg um, than, than Obama. Because he might, you know, he, he might have a better chance of learning on the job, understanding the market, given the fact that, that philosophically, I think if you ask him, yes, you know, capitalism, free markets, you know, they're the way to go. See, I don't think Obama actually feels that way. I think he's a socialist, whether he'll, he'll, he might not admit it, because socialists generally don't like to admit that that's what they are. 
uh, because they know that it's not popular. But if you look at what they believe in, and you can't differentiate it from what a socialist would believe. But, yeah, but, but, yeah, oh, anyway, but to answer my point is, so I, I think that, you know, when there are big problems, I think Obama will jump on the opportunity to blame it on capitalism and, and, and look for big government solutions, which will only compound the problems. We have one more, yeah. Ed, and then uh, we'll come to a close. Uh, speaking of elections, you have one very important one happening today, that we call elections. Yes. Yeah, you know, we have, you know, in the state governments, you have a situation where you have a governor that's trying to rein in uh, the excesses of spending, and particularly against you know government unionized uh, employees, which you know it's unfortunate. We shouldn't have uh, anybody who works for the government uh, being a member of a union. It's all, all it is is legalized extortion, because the, the the union members help elect the politicians, and it's the politicians that pay their salaries. And, and, and so they, it's a very incestuous process, but the taxpayer isn't anywhere involved. He just gets stuck with the bill. And so a lot of these government workers earn an enormous amount of money. In fact, the highest paid people in America now work for government. Right? It's, you know, it's, they're not really public servants anymore. It's the public that serves the government. We, we all exist to serve them. They're like, in America, it's, it's, it's almost like a new uh, nobility. Right? Our Constitution says that there's no titles of nobility. Yet the civil servants, the government, is now the nobility, and the country is just a bunch of peasants that have to support their, their lavish lifestyle. But you have a governor trying to rein it in slightly. I mean, you know, just, you know and it's, it's, you know, the, they've, they've mobilized all the troops to recall the governor, yank him out of office, right, because he has the nerve to admit that they can't afford to pay these lavish uh, salaries and benefits. So I think it's a very pivotal election uh, that potentially can have a chilling effect on other states. But again, it's similar. Look, this is the same thing that's playing out in, in, in Greece, right? Nobody wants to get off the dole. Everybody wants something for nothing. And, and it's interesting that whenever we call for sacrifice now, you've got, you've got people riding in the wagon and you've got people pulling the wagon. The people that are white riding in it are working for the government or collecting a check. Then you've got people that are, that, that are, that are, that are working and pulling the wagon. And it seems like when the politicians want sacrifice, they want the people who are pulling to pull harder, right? They never ask the people in the wagon to get out, right? And help everybody else pull it. And that's what's happening in Wisconsin. And the people in the wagon are all getting together and saying, we love this ride and, and, and we want it to keep on going. But eventually the people who are pulling the wagon, they're all gonna drop dead of exhaustion. And then the wagon ain't going anywhere. And, and that's where the U.S. is headed if we, want, we don't do something.